All right, welcome back. So good afternoon, morning. I think we're still before noon, right? So um, I am, my name is Eric Nichols. I am the Sustainability Engagement Coordinator here um, at UB. So I work in the office, uh, UB Sustainability. Um, I am serving as this session's facilitator, and um, I've been incredibly honored to be surrounded by so many strong female role models in this entire process, from behind the scenes to um, you know building up this summit in, in this day as well. So. Uh, round of applause for all of that, please. So this next panel um, is, follows the same format as the previous one, but um, it's, it's focus, it features policy experts and activists that will uh, share their insights and examples from their work about influencing sustainable change. Um, they may be separated by specialization, profession, and even stage of life, but uh, they're all united by their contributions to our collective um, understanding of climate change and sustainable development. Please join me in welcoming our distinguished panelists. We have Ngabre Adam. She is an Emerson High School student um, and is part of the Youth Climate Justice Fellowship from the Western New York Environmental Alliance. We have Dr. Susan Clark. She's the Policy Planning and Sustainability Specialist at, UB, at the UB Renew Institute. Dr. Trina Hamilton is the Associate Professor for UB Geography. Dr. Eli Moy is a visiting scholar from the UB Department of Urban and Regional Planning, and then Tonga Pham, Associate Vice President of UB Facilities. So uh, I'm going to begin with my friend Ngabre, um, and we're going to give all of our panelists about six minutes to explain, to tell us about themselves. So that could be you know, what your area of expertise is, what, your, what environmental challenges interest you, and uh, what policies or changes you are advancing and how you are addressing them. So Ngabre, if you wanna take it away. Why not, okay. So my name is Ngabre Adam and I'm a junior in high school. And I started environmental and social work at 14 when I started working on MAP, Massachusetts Avenue Project. It's a nonprofit organization that employs youth just like me. And so when I started there, I didn't really have interest in whatever I was doing. I was like, okay, I'm just gonna go to work, get my money and go home. So yeah, that's, and then when I kept doing it, I had a mentor, her name was Rebecca, and she really pushed me to like, see what I was going through as in like environmental wise. I didn't really care about climate change. I didn't even think that was something to be concerned about. And then till one day I went home and I talked to my parents and my parents were like, oh, yeah, climate change is happening. I mean, yeah, climate change is happening. And what are you going to do about it? I mean, you can't do nothing about it. Just leave it to the officials or whatever, the government's officials, they're going to take care of it. And then I kept doing the work that I was doing, going back and forth in my community, meeting with new people and seeing other youth like me Invo getting vo involved in this, and I was so passionate about it. And now that I'm 17, I had a lot of opportunities going back and forth, places like New York City, seeing like other youth like me doing the same thing that I'm doing, and I'm just like, wow, I wanna be like them. Oh, I wanna do this too. Like, I wanna make a change, basically. And so far, it's working out good for me because last year, yeah, last year I had a climate change workshop at NISOG in Baltimore. And I hosted it. It was fun. I didn't expect a lot of youth to come in my workshop, but then we, we were just talking about all this problems that we see around us and how we feel like we don't have voices because we're just young and we just, we depend on the older people. And we, we came up with strategies and ways that we could make our voices be heard, and yeah. All right, wonderful, thank you. Dr. Clark. Well, good morning. So I actually prepared some slides here to help keep my conversation in the short time we have more focused. So my name is Susan Clark, and I'm the Policy uh, Planning and Sustainability Specialist for the Renew Institute here at UB. 
And I'll just tell you briefly about my background because I think it's a little bit unique and very interdisciplinary. So I have a background in the natural sciences. I have a degree in atmospheric science and a master's in earth system science. But then I took a big shift um, when I started my PhD because I was more interested in the human dimensions. We mentioned this morning about finding a purpose. I wanted to think about how we can solve problems like climate change, which uh, encouraged me to get a degree in sustainability from Arizona State University. So here at Renew, um, and at UB. So RENEW stands for Research and Education in Energy, Environment, and Water. It was mentioned a few times this morning. But what we do at RENEW and some of these other research scientists that I have highlighted on my slide here is that we work with faculty from all the different departments and schools and colleges here at UB to bring them together to do collaborative and interdisciplinary work around sustainability issues. So we, we're new, we've only been here about two years, but we're still we're trying to make those linkages between the faculty, like the folks that you saw on the panel before me. And so the mission really of Renew is to organize knowledge around situations or sustainability problems rather than around the discipline. And so the model that we're going for is more like a web where we have people from different disciplines and expertise and practitioners and community stakeholders all working together to solve a problem, right, instead of the more traditional academic model on the left, which would be more like a tree, where each discipline and department might represent a different branch, and the folks in those branches or departments don't really talk to each other that much. And so we're trying to facilitate those collaborations across campus and in the Buffalo region and really beyond. So I want to tell you about one particular problem that I'm trying to bring folks together here at UB to address. And it's a personal passion of mine and research interest. So um, it's no secret that the infrastructure in the United States is in a state of crisis. So this is the report card from the American Society of Civil Engineers telling us that our infrastructure at the national level earns a grade of a D plus, right? It's a failing grade, and it's gonna take trillions of dollars to repair and upgrade these systems over the next few years to get them in good functioning order. At the same time, the funding, the investments at the federal level have been declining over time, shown in this up, upper left-hand corner. And on the right, you're seeing a graph of the increases in the total costs and losses from natural catastrophes, right? So with climate change and the increase in extreme events, we're seeing more losses to our infrastructure um, and our cities and our communities. But that doesn't include all of these events in 2017 related to the cyclone activity, right? Hurricane Irma and Maria that have devastated parts of the United States. And so the typical way of addressing this problem at the policy level or at the federal level of the United States is that we do vulnerability assessments of different infrastructure systems. Um, and then we channel our investments towards those systems that are considered most vulnerable or might have the biggest impact in terms of um, hurting our economy. Uh, but this is problematic because we've identified 18 different critical infrastructure sectors. And in order to address those vulnerabilities, we just have to spread the little, what little investments that we do have across these different infrastructure sectors. And so I think there needs to be a better way to sort out how we're prioritizing which infrastructure systems are most important. And so here at UB, um, I'm trying to get the folks in my sort of web of knowledge around infrastructure, resilience, to think about infrastructure in a different way. So I think about infrastructure in the way I think that we should think about infrastructure is around the services that it provides our communities rather than just how vulnerable it is or how you know, valuable it is to the economy. So for example, really, we don't really care about the electrons going through our power lines, but we care about charging our cell phone, the ability to take a hot shower, heating our homes, refrigerating our foods, and all of those things. And when we start to emphasize those services, it takes away the emphasis on the physical infrastructure. And then an event like a disaster, like Hurricane Maria hitting Puerto Rico, we can start to think about how we can provide these critical services to our communities, even if that centralized physical infrastructure is disrupted or failing. And so to illustrate this a little bit more clearly, so this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And I'm sure most of you have probably seen this at one point or another. And it's just one theory of human development that we can, that we can think about here to help guide how we think about human needs and how people are motivated. But Maslow basically tells us that we're motivated and we fulfill our needs in a particular order. So our physiological needs, our need for food, water, sleep, the things that help us survive are most critical, they're most urgent. 
And then once those needs are fulfilled, at least to a sufficient level, then people tend to be motivated by our safety needs, our need for love and belonging, esteem, you know, having self-confidence and self-actualization, living life to its fullest. And what I've done is here, and I think I'm the first to do this, is try to connect these different needs to different infrastructure sectors. And so this gives us some reason and some um, way to conceptualize through human development theory that why we should care mostly about food, water, emergency services in a disaster type situation. In a world where we don't have enough resources to protect everything, we have to think about which are the most urgent needs that we need to protect in a disaster situation. And so in this way, I'm trying to get folks to think about infrastructure different and, and really influence policy at the federal level, but also at the community level of how Thinking in this way changes how we emphasize why we care about infrastructure. Is it about vulnerability or is it about impacts on our economy or is it about human well-being and how we live you know, productive and quality lives? And so just to end, these are the folks, and this isn't everybody, but the folks I've been working closely with around this subject of resilient infrastructure systems. It includes folks from the city of Buffalo and also Erie County as well. Um, and the, really here the mission is that together, we are able to solve this problem in a more holistic and better way than I would be able to on my own. So, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Hamilton. Bring it down here. Um, I'm Trina Hamilton from the Geography Department. I'm an associate professor there. Um, and I have two research areas around sustainability. One is looking at pressures on companies to be greener and more sustainable. And the other is looking at urban sustainability politics. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. And my interest as a social scientist is in how we can really inject more justice into our urban greening processes. And we often talk about the three pillars. We heard about this earlier today of um, sustainability being the social, the economic, and the environmental. Um, but for the social, we're often looking for these broad win-win-win situations. And what I and my colleagues are looking at more specifically is about the concept of justice, and specifically the idea of allowing long-standing communities to stay in place um, and not be displaced as their communities green. So when we traditionally think of a green city, um, images like this pop into our heads. This is actually what pops into Google image search if you put green city. Um, and they're very beautiful landscapes. Some of these are from one of my hometowns of Vancouver. Uh, another one is the High Line in New York City that some of you may recognize. But these cities that regularly top you know, the green city indexes um, are also often the most expensive, where the average housing you know, cost is a million dollars to buy uh, a single family home. So what we're trying to do is understand alternative visions for greening. And as a social scientist, I'm interested in how do these alternative visions come together and gain political power. Um, and so this research really started about a decade ago when a colleague of mine from DePaul University in Chicago and I um, came together because we um, saw in the news that the New York State Attorney General, that was Cuomo at the time, um, was suing ExxonMobil over this big underground oil plume that was underneath Brooklyn. It was bigger than the Exxon Valdez spill, um, but many of us had never heard of it. And that was surprising to those of us who study corporate responsibility and hadn't heard that there was this big um, oil plume under Brooklyn. So we went to investigate, and our expectation was that the reason that they were now suing ExxonMobil and trying to clean up this area was to transition it from an industrial zone to um, you know, what we call the parks, cafes, and a river walk model of sustainability, which is really you know, moving towards a post-industrial landscape where it's all about recreation. Um, and basically playgrounds for the wealthy often. Um, but what we found surprised us. We found that actually there was a community consensus being developed in the neighborhood. And this is North Brooklyn along Newtown Creek, um, which separates Brooklyn and Queens, um, which is a longstanding industrial waterway. And what we found when we started interviewing people there was that largely due to these five angry women, that's what one of our um, interview subjects from a big environmental group called them lovingly, um, largely because of them, these environmental groups like Riverkeeper and others who had come in, the attorney general who had come in um, and were pushing for environmental cleanup, they got schooled basically in the community's concerns um, and the community had a real identity as a working class industrial community that wanted to maintain 
manufacturing jobs because they were seen as better paying and wanted to retain the right to stay in place and not have you know, their neighborhood turned over to high-end um, condominiums and river walks and that sort of thing. But they were also really motivated by environmental health concerns. So, you know, these women had been pushing for decades against incinerators and all sorts of toxic um, uses in their neighborhood. Um, so they were really trying to bring these things together in an alternative vision for the city, um, or rather for their neighborhood in the city. Um, so what's happened since then is what we might think of as hidden greening. So in contrast to the kind of spectacular green urbanism of High Lines and other big um, greening projects, they are actively working to increase the pockets of green and ecological regeneration um, within this industrial zone while protecting the zoning. I know Martha earlier talked about zoning not being very exciting, but I get excited about it as well. Um, and so this is similar, I think, to what she's working on in Buffalo is that the goal is creating different kinds of green spaces while also maintaining good paying um, working class jobs. Um, so you can see there's a quote here from um, some manufacturing and warehouse workers who use these spaces now. We often don't um, you know, actively plan green spaces for those types of um, people, but they would you know, go to these spaces after work and talk about They'd have a cigarette and a beer, but they'd also then um, notice that there's fish coming back to this, um, you know, this Newtown Creek. There's more oysters coming back and egrets and other sorts of ecological regeneration. So it's also a way of creating new kind of ecological consciousness um, amongst populations that we traditionally don't um, target for that. So how I'm trying to um, you know, engage in terms of policy um, and making my work relevant is through producing books, which often um, have more purchase and um, get our ideas out into the world um, more broadly than just producing oh, academic journal articles, um, but also trying to write op-eds and other, um, you know, more public, using more public forums um, to express these ideas and to inject an, you know, alternative vision of what green cities can look like um, and also engage criticism of these concepts. So we have been working with researchers in other cities, I'll keep bringing that back, um, to try to understand how the dynamics are different. This particular community was lucky in that Cuomo was ambitious, so he wanted a big case to take on. Um, they also were lucky that Riverkeeper just happened to turn their boat down Newtown Creek one day and notice the oil sheen, and they came and gave additional kind of political power to their activism. Um, so we want to understand how these processes work differently and to you know, identify gaps where voices might not be um, represented in other cities and other neighborhoods and try to bring those to the fore as well in sustainability planning. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Moy. Hello, good afternoon everyone, and thank you for sticking around for the afternoon session. Um, so I'm a postdoctoral fellow um, at the Community for Global Health Equity, and also with the UB Food Systems Planning and Healthy Communities Lab. Um, so my office sits in the Department of Urban and Regional Planning, but my training is actually in public health and obesity prevention. So I thought as a somewhat recent graduate, um, I could offer the perspective of sort of my journey and what's brought me from public health to planning, especially for the younger folks in our audience. Um, so I finished my doctoral studies in nutrition and uh, system science at the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, where my dissertation research focused on looking at the um, urban neighborhood food system. So looking at how neighborhood crime as an indicator of the neighborhood social environment um, relates to food swamps in an urban city, or looking at how vacant properties as an indicator of the neighborhood built environment and how that impacts the food environment across the city. Um, so prior to my doctoral studies, I completed my uh, masters in public health, focusing in health policy at the Yale School of Public Health, and also worked in Washington, D.C. for a couple of years as a health communications specialist um, for NCOR, which is the National Collaborative on Childhood Obesity Research. So all of that is just to share um, that my experiences over the last 10 years or so have really informed this evolution in my work um, and my focus today, um, I think in three main ways. Um, one being, while I started in nutrition and focusing on individual level behavior change, 
I soon came to realize that this wasn't enough, that we had to supplement it by looking at environmental um, changes and sustainable environmental changes. Um, and so we've, of course, seen a lot of growth in that area of work over the last decade or two. Um, secondly, I think when we talk about the environment, this can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Um, from the public health perspective, there's been a lot of focus on the built environment. So thinking about green space, walkable space, sidewalks and buildings, uh, which are all absolutely critical. Um, but I think there's also a lot of opportunity to focus also on the social environment. So what's happening to individuals and networks among individuals as the built environment and buildings are changing around them. Um, and so thirdly, a big part of my work is focusing on um, cross-disciplinary work and trying to um, build bridges, whether it's across disciplines or across levels from community um, members and community leaders all the way to the policy level to really inform more effective um, and comprehensive work. So today, now my work focuses more on um, healthy and sustainable community environments. So I focus from the lens of food systems planning, but also connections with housing security. So what are the trade-offs between food and housing? Um, who is making those trade-offs and um, how can we work across different sectors to make sure that we are not um, adding burden but lifting up the strengths that already exist in those communities. Great, thank you. And Tonga? Uh, good morning. It's morning still, right? Afternoon. Sorry, good afternoon. I'm, I'm being interrogated is what I feel like right now because I think I got the seat with like the worst light. It's like right on me. So bear with me as I kind of stare out to the nether. Um, so I am with University Facilities. Uh, I did my undergraduate in chemical engineering, so, and I'm also a professional engineer, so I probably am the ultimate geek on this panel. Um, and then I also followed up getting an MBA uh, with a specialty in real estate finance. Um, so University Facilities looks after, it's pretty easy. I, I like always to say engineers are not a creative bunch, so when we name things, it's very specific. Um, we look after all the facilities on all three campuses, so North Campus, South Campus, and the new downtown campus that we just created. Um, so we do things like the day-to-day -day operations, um, so we make sure electricity's here, heat's on, you know, doors work, um, everything's clean, the landscape's clean, and then we also get to do really cool stuff where we get to do complete gut renovations, we get to build brand new buildings, design brand new buildings, we get to design landscape, we get to inform, um, you know, all the campuses and how they are, are used um, by staff, faculty, students, visitors onto our campus. So I think it's a a very nice mix of um, getting to do a whole bunch of cross-sectional um, type of work. Um, in terms of sustainability, um, that's just a personal passion of mine and I was uh, one of the lucky few that got to kind of bridge that into my professional life. Um, so I kind of just brought that in and it's, it's all back to, I guess for me, taking it back, and I'm gonna channel Elon Musk, back to first principles. Um, so I kind of look at sustainability in terms of, you know, going back to the infrastructure that we already currently have, how do we make it better, enhance it, kind of get away from that throwaway economy where, you know, we're just kind of doing stuff with planned obsolescence in it, but, you know, with infrastructures that we do already have, rather than just abandoning and building new, how do we kind of um, rejuvenate it, how can we look at it differently, um, you know, and how do we kind of have limited resources, how do we kind of spread that? And I think somebody kind of talked to her about that, right, about, yeah. So, you know, um, in keeping with the state, you know, or the United States, um, you know, there's trillions of deferred maintenance. So maintenance that hasn't been done or renewal that has to get completed, where do you put those finite resources? And that's one of the things that I also look at and I'm quite passionate about what do we do here at UB across the three campuses. Um, the other cool thing that I get to do is help all the researchers, um, you know, to kind of do their research on campus, um, make sure that they have the infrastructure that's available for them on campus, um, and just kind of help them kind of move along. So I, like I said, I'm, I'm very lucky to, to have that uh, privilege here and opportunity. Yeah, lots of questions from our office coming at you constantly, right? 
So uh, thank you all for that. Um, so I, I have a few questions, and, I'll, and I, I'll leave space for audience questions as well. So start thinking about those. Um, but just like start us all off here. Uh, sustainable development is only attainable when the needs and interests of both women and men are recognized. Um, women won't fully benefit from sustainable development until there are more women um, contributing equally to policy development because women are under because women are underrepresented on all levels in policy and decision making processes. Basically, what needs what more needs to be done to increase the participation of women in policy and decision making roles? You all have very different roles here at the university as well. So, if you can speak to where you're coming from in your places of of work or life, as, that would be great. And whoever wants to answer can. Uh, <laughs> I'll take a first stab at it. Um, so I think one approach is to think about um, the, the spectrum of women, so from very early on um, when they're young girls, um, and also thinking about more seasoned women. So when thinking about younger girls, and I think the opening panel talked about this too, um, exposing young girls to these possibilities and being in these positions um, to inform policy and um, connecting young girls to those women in those positions. Um, so, I mean, I, I, th I know I've certainly benefited from having strong female mentors in my life. Um, and so I think that's a really important component. Um, and thinking about more seasoned, advanced professional women, I think that there are certainly needs to shift the culture and expectations um, and um, think about strategies to retain those women who are already in those positions and also come up with ideas for how can we make sure that we advance women who are on that trajectory um, and just getting started. I think setting an example is a good thing because um, we're, like, we're born to a world that we know that women are not treated as equal as men. And I have seen that because like my parents work and my mom is always complaining about how, oh, I'm, I do all this and we do the same work with them, but they get more money than we get. And I'm just, and then she's always just asking my opinion all the time because she, she comes home stressed. She's like, what would you do? What would you do? Because she's always having arguments with her boss about her not getting paid enough money. And me, like, I, I feel like I'm being raised in a world where I feel like I'm equal to like a, a man. And I feel like, yeah. And I was raised to think about, okay, you deserve better. And don't, I don't know, like every time I go to like, I, I work, I go to school. So every time I go to school, I always think about, okay, I don't see a man, I don't see a woman, I'm just, I'm here, what's up? And yeah, and then, I don't know, it's just like setting an example and making, like exposing young people to thinking that they could get, they deserve better and they could go anywhere they want to. And the imagery of like a man, oh, a man is, he deserves this and you, I don't know, I feel like the term, I hate when people are always like, okay, men get more money than we women do. Instead of talking, we should just do actions. I feel like we, I don't know. I feel like we shouldn't say that word, oh, man gave more money. Because like, we raise our own kids to think about, oh, man gave more money. That, that, you know, that saying, I just don't like it. I don't, yeah, I don't know what to say. Um, just, this on. Just speaking to um, the world of urban kind of sustainability planning, one thing that I think would help is if more um, planning processes looked inward to existing communities, not only women, but other marginalized communities and voices. Um, often we've had the phenomenon where, and there are um, geographers who um, have become these people, but where co um, communities and cities look to the outside expert to bring in some outside consultant with a magic bullet for, um, you know, kind of reshaping our communities. And 
I think instead what um, a lot of researchers, women and men, um, are now coming to, those of us who are interested in justice and sustainability, um, is the fact that we need situated sustainabilities. That's not my term, but there's um, scholars like Julie Z and others who are now using that, meaning that we have to figure out what is right for a particular place that incorporates place-based um, justice into it. So it's looking internally for voices rather than always looking to the external consultant. So I have, I think, two points that I want to make. So uh, stemming from some of the um, things that I talked about um, when I was giving my introduction, I think just inherently by doing more collaborative interdisciplinary research, we're doing a lot to be more inclusive in the research world and also um, influencing policy as a result of that. And so, you know, there's particular fields, you know, engineering is one of those, um, also science that tend to, you know, have more males in the system right now. But with, through interdisciplinary work, and if we're engaging in, say, more of the environmental sciences or social sciences where maybe there's more gender equality, that we are opening pathways for more women to be involved in STEM research and influencing policy um, more generally. Um, the second thought that I had was, um, I actually, I read a, article more recently um, that was talking about uh, Iceland and their sort of uh, experience with making more of a gender equal um, representation in their country. So uh, the first female president of Iceland was elected back in 1980 and at that time there was 5% uh, of parliament was female. And now we have this, that same female president I believe is still in office um, and now it's known as one of the most gender equal parliaments uh, in the world. And so I think by electing females and sort of females voting for their values and all people voting for their values will just naturally allow more pathways for more gender equal representation. And part of the issues that I think hold women back, like the gender pay gap, um, parental leave, daycare, these things that um, tend to influence women, uh, will just naturally become issues that are spoken more about and addressed um, more often than otherwise. And so that's a nice segue, and that's what I was just thinking at a more macro level, right? I think at in its root cause, it all kind of comes back to a lot of the stereotypes that, that we have in our society, right? Um, about a woman's role or what what's cool for girls to do and not to do through, through their educational journey. Um, so I kind of look at it and think, you know, we can all vote today. Um, you know, having all of these things everybody discussed, I think would be very helpful, but there's immediate action that we can take today, and we vote with our pocketbooks, right? So we all know those firms out there that aren't maybe living up to the standards, that do have gender gaps amongst their C-suite, um, you know, all of those types of things, and we can make that change today by voting with our pocketbook, right? So we can kind of go out there and affect that change at the grassroots level and saying, no, I, I don't support that. I don't support the mission and vision or the values of where you're, you're taking your company or, you know, your marketing, your branding. I mean, especially in this day and age with social media where, you know, um, it's word can get out, it can go viral, it can go quickly, and, you know, to be able to set up grassroots campaigns that can kind of go out there and voice our opinions and voice our choices uh, can be made and I, I think it'd be quite effective and expedient. Great, thank you. So I have one more question. Um, can, can you share an example of maybe a sustainable policy or change that you, that you have influenced or advanced that is maybe informed by a gendered perspective? So I don't know about you guys, but this was a very difficult question for me to think about. And I think it, we've seen other panelists um, before this uh, session say that this is kind of a tough question because I think we're somewhat privileged um, to be brought up in a society where, at least I know from in my experience, I didn't feel like I was you know, discriminated against really as a woman. Um, and so I think of myself as a scientist and as a, as a person you know, that has had my own unique experiences. Um, although those experiences, I'm sure, have been shaped because I am a woman. You know, one of those things, um, that, one of the examples, I guess, is that I was a student athlete. Um, I played college volleyball, and um, I think part of the reason I was able to do that was because of a policy, Title IX, um, you know, that, that required um, equal number of scholarships for male and female, female athletes. And so I, I hate to think... I don't like to think that I'm influencing changes necessarily because I'm a woman, because I'm a person that has had um, unique experiences. So that was my initial reaction to the question. 
Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think Elizabeth in the first panel kind of said it best. And, and for me, I kind of align myself with, I'm a professional engineer. And that's how I kind of look at first and foremost. And, and I don't see that differentiation. Um, and then quite frankly, I mean, I've always been this. So I don't know what the male perspective, like what a male version of me being a professional engineer would be. It, it's kind of a, I, I really struggled when, when I kind of saw that, that question as well. Um, but that said, having been in, you know, the business sector, both public as well as in the private sector, I think women kind of bring a different nuance, especially in a leadership role. Um, from what I see, I think naturally, um, we like to build relationships more. Um, and not to say that, you know, with my next statement, it's not to say that we're not as competitive, but I think we don't have that same zero sum mentality. Um, and by zero sum, what that means is basically you win, you lose. It's binary. It's either zero or one, right? And I think um, I think it's a little bit different um, with with women leaders from what I've seen, where I think the you know the approach is more of um, a compromise, more of wanting to listen, um, of taking in other people's perspectives a little bit. I mean, I think that's just a, a more innate um, sense that that we may have. I'm not saying men don't do that either. I really don't want to go out there saying that, but I, I think that might be the main difference. Um, just to add, I guess, you know, I never like to essentialize the differences between the genders, but I think we are obviously still socialized differently. Um, and one thing that a lot of studies of um, CEOs and executives has found, for instance, um, that men are more likely to present a kind of heroic narrative of how they got to the top versus women um, who talk about the networks of support that they got to get there. Um, and so I guess when I go to do my own research about you know political power and how communities gain power, I'm always looking for the networks and making sure that we try to interview as many people as possible who could have been um, part of that campaign rather than looking for, you know, kind of a single linchpin to the campaign. So, you know, in my example, although I talked about Attorney General Cuomo being kind of critical to gaining, you know, some um, media attention to the issue, it was really the foundation that those five angry women had made for decades that allowed them to kind of move towards this alternative. So it's really looking for those networks of um, influence. Okay, so I like to I like to think it of this way. Um, when people say, "Oh, we're all born equal. We're all humans." Okay, we're all, all humans. But then, why, like, in terms of jobs, why do we get treated differently? I don't know. But reasons like yesterday it was yesterday. Um, I take U.S. So my teacher, she was teaching us this the role of the woman in nineteen fifties, and he said that uh, women were expected to stay stay home, take care of the kids. And that's what's considered a perfect woman. And then this boy in my class, he was like, "Oh, I still think it should be that way because my mom raised, like my mom raised us. She didn't work, this and that." And then this other girl, she was like, "No, okay, what if it was you in my shoes?" And you know what he said? Nah, I'm a guy. I'm more, like I have more rights. Like I could lift things. Can you? And then every every girl in my class, I don't know, they almost kill her. They went back and forth talking about some, I could slap you, can you? And then it was just too much. But I feel like we're both equal. And without a woman, I don't think the guys will be alive. I mean, <laughs> no, like, we, they gave birth to you. I feel like I, there's something there. <laughs> but I don't know. And I was raised... Like my parents are traditional, so when I was, I'm African, so when I was back in Africa, my mom, she didn't work, she used to stay home, take care of us, but when she, when we came, when we came to America, everything just changed, and my dad used to always be like, okay, now you have a job, now you feel like you're the man of the house, this and that, and you know what my mom told her, told him, we're in America, this is what we do, and then he got bad, <laughs> yeah, he got bad, and then, I don't know, it's just like, we're both equal, and we have sp like we're both special in different ways. And I feel like the kids, the, in this generation, we're raised to think that we're equal. And I feel like in the future it's gonna be better. There's not never gonna be such a thing. I was men are more privileged than women, or men deserve better than women. That's all I have. Oh uh, yeah, I think that I'll build on that and. Um 
to contextualize my response, I'll just share a little personal anecdote. And I think my lived experience as an um, Asian American woman um, really informs and influences the work that I do. Um, so my father emigrated from Hong Kong and mother emigrated from South Korea. Um, they randomly met each other in Oklahoma of all places. Um, and then moved, eventually moved to California where I grew up in a city called Bakersfield, um, Central California, which, is, which was then predominantly white. Um, and so growing up within the household, because mom and dad spoke different languages, we also, we spoke English, and so within the household, I was obviously learning English in school, and I felt more American inside the household, um, but once I was outside the home amongst my peers, I felt less American because I was being brought up a different way compared to my peers. Um, another example, for whatever reason, I tended to have more uh, male friends as a youth and teenager, which did not thrill my father. Um, <laughs> And so, you know, whether it was because I was Asian American or a woman, I always felt a little off kilter. Um, and I think that that lived experience has m caused me to be more self-reflective about my position in this world. And as a result of that, I'm always questioning and, you know, looking at what are others' positions in this world and why is it that way? So always asking the question of who is not at the table? What are the voices that are not being heard? Um, and so that thinking and that lived experience really informs the work that I do every day. Great. Do we have any questions from the audience? Any? All right, we have a few. Of I have a question I'd like to bounce off the panelists. And it was a question I had for the previous panel as well. But in your experiences, have you come across any creative or especially effective solutions to pollution and the issues regarding waste and recycling and trash? Well, my, my response probably isn't going to be popular, and I don't know where Ryan is, but he's going to start <laughs> laughing. So I, I, I self-identify as being a minimalist, and the number one way to do all that is to not purchase and not to use or really think about what you're purchasing and what you're using in our day-to-day -day lives, right? Um, you know, by the time we think about it at the downstream where we have the garbage or the materials that needs to be recycled or anything else, I think it's, it's too late. Um, and, and, you know, you we're basically looking for that silver bullet. I think we need to kind of consider that whole stream early on. I'm sure you all seen on YouTube how stuff is made or the cycle stuff or something. And it's really in keeping to that, right? I mean, you kind of almost need to think at the very beginning and questioning, you know, um, do I need this or not, you know, um, and then next would be, you know, was it made in sustainable ways, you know, and you kind of start applying those kind of, um, I guess, criteria to it around the, the triple bottom line and kind of go through there. So the planet profit for people, right? So was it made, you know, in a sweatshop or was it made where people got fair wages and were given, you know, healthcare benefits, et cetera? Was it, you know, did we mine half the free world in order to make a piece of plastic? What's going to happen to that plastic after I don't use these kind of things? So that would be my perspective on how to think about trying to reduce garbage, recycling, pollution, et cetera. I'll just add, um, I think to refer to Sarah Badad's work, who was on the previous panel, um, that it's both the consumer's choice at the beginning about what to consume, but also the designer's choice of how to design things. So she's involved in the e-waste and designing electronics. Um, there's another company that I know called Interface, which is a carpet company that's kind of well known for the CEO having this environmental awakening. Um, and they now design their carpet tiles specifically to be reused and recycled so that it's easier um, to do that once you know, people are done with them and that you can also, you know, rip up a few tiles at a time instead of, um, you know, a whole room of carpet. So it's figuring out how to design things to make the, um, I think, the recycling and reuse easier as well. For me, um, I think there's sort of two main ways that you could maybe answer this question. Um, one is uh, around increasing just the awareness of what it is that you're consuming and the impacts that it has. I know um, earlier this morning, we talked about social media and that being an avenue for understanding um, the impacts of, you know, the things that we consume in our waste, but also bringing it closer to home. You know, in our energy bills, we see how much energy we're consuming, 
you know, if we put something in there and that results in this amount of greenhouse gases, right? Um, or just keeping track of the amount of waste that a household is, you know, building up. Having that information more clearly related to your own behaviors, I think, will allow people to be more proactive in changing their behaviors overall. Um, and the other thing, I hate to say it, but, and I wouldn't have said this before sharing an office with an economist, but um, you need, you know, incentives um, and financial incentives help, uh, you know, pricing goods that are more sustainable, um, you know, at a reduced price and things that are not at a higher price, right, will make a difference. Um, and also, you know, every time we make a purchase, right, we are, uh, you know, saying something. Um, so the more we purchase more sustainable goods, right, the more that there'll be a demand for those things and less of a demand for those other things. So I think more holistically being more self-aware, but also having incentives to help people make a decision even when they might not be aware of all those other things um, is definitely the way we need to move. Inga Beery, could you go into brief detail of how uh, Massachusetts Avenue Project has influenced uh, what you're doing now, especially with you being here on the panel, does it have a role in having a, a sustainability mindset? Yeah, because when I started working there, they were exposing me to all this like environmental issues. Like we used to have people come in and teach us, oh, this is what ha what's happening around your community. This is the this is what you guys are lacking. And they just used to talk about how all this, all these issues that we were facing, we could just like have an impact. Like as at Massachusetts Avenue Project, there's like all types of like youth, youth of color. I mean, it's just an interaction. And then some of the, we farm, we work on the garden, we do all this fun stuff. We we go on field trips to meet with other youth in New York City. And then we do public speaking. I was so shy when I started working there. She used to always make me talk. It's Rebecca, her name is Rebecca. She used to always make me talk and I would just look at her like, what are, why are you making me do this, why are you making me do this? And then she was always like, okay, it's gonna come in good use someday. And yeah, it kinda did. <laughs> Okay, and then we used to go to these plantations and just saw how food grow. I mean, grew. And then I feel like I'm I have a, an opportunity to work at Map because not every teenager gets an opportunity to go see how food grows, or like work in policy work, go to city hall, talk to the officials. I tell you, I always go there all the time, and they they're tired of me. It's it's fun. And then, yeah, so as I kept working at MAP and being exposed to all these people and making a connection with people, I was like, okay, this is something that will come in good use someday. And this is something I like doing, going to places and connecting with people and getting my voice out there. Like last, in 2016, yeah, it was in 2016. I don't know. But like, yeah, 2017, I went to, the climate match in DC, and I got to be connected with a lot of people from a lot of youth from Minnesota and all these kind of good places. So, and then when I come back home, I was like, okay, I could use my voice to educate other youth about what I saw. And I'm a strong advocate about youth education to like social and environmental issues. And yeah, that's how it came to be. And now I'm just happy about the work that I do. I even talked to my like fellow students about the work that I do. And I remember the one day I told my teacher, oh, after school, I'm going to farming. And this boy looked at me like, what? Isn't that child labor? And I was like, no. Actually, I worked there for only two hours and I get paid for doing that. And then he was like, you get paid for doing that? And then yes, and I was like, okay, it's helping people too. And then he was like, okay, wait, listen, I, I work at McDonald's and I do this and that. And I was like, okay, the fact that you're working, it's helping yourself. But like, you could also work at the farm and get the experience. And he actually came up to me and he told me to like, you know, show him where I work at. And I did. And he was really happy about it. And 
Yeah. <laughs> right, I think we have time for a couple more questions up here. Hi, um, my name is Janira Dale. I'm like public health student, undergraduate. Um, a lot of you are talking about a lot of different issues that overlap in my life in one way or another. Like I grew up in New York City, you know, I grew up in Bed-Stuy, I saw food deserts, you know, I saw gentrification take over my childhood neighborhood. And I wanna ask you all, like looking at the room that is in front of you, if you notice, there are not a lot of people here who look like me, you know? There are not a lot of people here who resemble the people who we are trying to help with our work. And I wanted to know if you guys had any recommendations for trying to approach systems with more diversity or like even just telling people, hey, maybe you're trying to help people who don't look like you, here are better ways to go about it. Because I feel like that's something we're missing a lot. As I go out into like the field and I do like volunteer work and I'm like starting to meet people, a lot of people don't like working with people who don't look like that because they have trust issues. And I want to know how you th guys think you could combat that respective to your different fields. Um, well, certainly this has been a kind of big reckoning, I think, within the environmental movement in um, the United States, and luckily there's starting to be a recognition that um, diversity has been lacking um, in the environmental movement. Um, in terms of the research around environmental gentrification and the um, activism around it, I think one thing that, you know, these are kind of jargony academic terms, but we're starting to try to understand how to not do what people are calling settler environmentalism. So not come in as an outside environmental group and impose your kind of will on a community, but rather to figure out how to do solidarity environmentalism, right, to come in and maybe use your political power to help elevate the, um, the voices um, in the media or, you know, with politicians, um, but to recognize that we need to figure out how to do that. And I don't have answers about how to do that well. Certainly, it was something that I think is important that we mention, a reason why the community that I worked in um, maybe had success was it was a predominantly white working class community. And I know that um, some other communities that are communities of color, it's even harder to kind of get that political power and those political allies. Um, so it's not something I have um, an answer to, but it's something that at least those of us in the social sciences especially are increasingly working on and concerned, um, concerned about. So I think it's a really important issue that you raise. Thank you. Um, so I am one of the lucky ones where I lead a pretty big team, um, about 530 people. And so I like to say how I'm doing my share locally is that I'm trying to educate my staff about diversity and the benefits of having diversity on any teams, um, right? It's, it's really important to have people with different perspectives, different experience, life experience, everything else um, on a team because I think that's how, that's how you build your strength. Um, so that's the one area that I'm trying to bring right now to, to the team is just to talk about it, talk about what does diversity look like. Um, this isn't a, you know, status kind of thing, oh, we, we got to check that box off, but rather what are the true benefits and advantages um, for us to kind of build a more diverse team. So hoping to get that education kind of out and, and maybe, they, you know, they can kind of go on and just continue to perpetuate and, and it'll kind of build and ripple out. So um, I can speak to the perspective of a public health researcher. Um, and it's always, it's something that I think is at the forefront of my mind in thinking about inclusion and diversity, both in my research and in my teaching. So in terms of teaching, making sure that my colleagues and students that I'm working with is a diverse group so that you are hearing different perspectives and voices. Um, and then in the research process, you know, I think that there's been a growth in community-engaged research, um, community-engaged participatory research, but I think it's not only important to engage, but to really work with community partners and build those relationships from the beginning and then see it all the way through and then even after whatever work you've been working on is done to make sure that the outcome is in fact serving those community members that you were working with to begin with. Um, and so, yeah, I think that there's just there's opportunity to improve in that process, um, and then at the same time, educating the young people and working with young people to make sure that this is something that continues to grow as we move forward.
All right, in the sake of time, I know we had a few more questions, but um, our time is up. And I, I, we're ending on a fantastic question, and I ask everybody in this room to hold on to those thoughts of what, of what the panelists had said and the question itself as we go forward. Um, so on behalf of um, the Women in STEM Collaborative and UB Sustainability, I'd like to thank um, you all for sharing your, your thoughts and experiences. And you all know your work is important and inspiring, and uh, I just want to thank you for that.